everyone. This is Michael Zenga. We're here with episode five of the BJJ Fanatics podcast. My business partner and podcast partner, Mr. Bernardo Faria, is in Brazil. So I'm going to get to talk a lot more this time. That's always a good thing. I'm here with the best-selling instructor in the history of the BJJ Fanatics store, Mr. John Donaher, who's also widely probably thought of as the best grappling coach in the world. And also his black belts, uh, my coach... Travis Stevens. I think you forgot my name. <laughs> I have. You've choked me out so many times I could, but not at this time. It's an honor to be with these guys. John's up from New York. We've been filming a DVD all day on the um, the whole Jujigatami, the straight arm bar. And if it seems like it's cold in here, it seems like we're shivering. It is because we've had the heat off all day, so it wouldn't make any, uh, any sound. But it's starting to warm up now. And uh, great to be here, guys. So... John, without further ado, want to tell us a little bit about Juju Katami? Um, th- we, it's fascinating we're talking about this. We're just filming it all day. And um, in between uh, various takes, we often discuss the history of Juju Katami, how it became such a big part of uh, Jiu Jitsu, Sambo, and, and Judo. Um, it's got a fascinating history and some, some, uh, some strange elements involved. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware that. Uh, Grappling has been a more or less documented sport for, for many thousands of years. There are many ancient drawings of, of uh, human beings engaging in what is obviously some kind of wrestling or grappling training. Um, some of it looks a lot like modern wrestling. Um, uh, there are also, of course, many, many uh, different martial arts traditions around the world, all of which we see statues, we see um, uh, uh, written words about it chronicling what these guys were doing um often there's all kinds of figurines and and uh, cave drawings etc cetera, etc cetera. um so you know the, the the idea of grappling is it's well documented has been around for thousands and thousands of years and yet uh in the case of jujigatami we don't see any renditions of jujigatami outside of one country japan until the 20th century, when Japan had opened up and began spreading their, their, their grappling technology around the world. Um, we have pages upon pages upon pages of uh, Western drawings, um, medieval drawings of, of ancient Western martial arts showing grappling, sword play, spear play, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no Jujigatami in there. Um, we have all kinds of figurines from around the world, various martial and grappling traditions, no Jujigatami. Um, it's it's a strange, strange thing that uh, Jujigatami appears to have arisen only in the Japanese martial arts tradition. Interestingly, there are pictures depicting Jujigatami going back quite a long way in Japanese history. Uh, Japan, of course, is a very isolated country for uh, a long part of its history, and um, it's just an odd thing that this incredibly powerful move which is such a, a fixture in modern day grappling appears to have arisen only in one culture uh, it's been around a lot longer than say for example uh, the triangle which is a relatively recent innovation apparently also out of japan but to the best of our knowledge there doesn't seem to be any uh, uh use of judigatami outside of japan prior to the 20th century at least we don't have any documented evidence of it um so it's a fascinating thing to think that one culture came up with this move and um, uh, seemed to hold it for so long. And then once it went exported, it became a huge part of the various grappling sports that were influenced by uh, by the Japanese tradition. You had the Russian Sambo tradition where um, Judigatami plays a very, very important role. And uh, if you watch international sambo, the, the performance of Jujigatami Jiu- is very, very good. Um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, obviously, uh, Jujigatami is one of the main moves. The armbar is one of the main moves that uh, that, that characterizes the sport. Um, even non-Asiatic uh, uh, traditions, the, the uh, various catch wrestling styles of Europe and America seem to have taken on board variations of Jujigatami after the 20th century and recognized that it, it was a, a valuable addition to what they were already doing. Although, interestingly, 
catch wrestling always seems to have favored twisting arm locks, like Kimura variations or, or Americana variations over straight arm locks. That's always been an interesting uh, element of, of the catch wrestling tradition. But um, nonetheless, you see good catch wrestlers in photographs demonstrating uh, things that look a lot like uh, uh, Judikitami variations after the 20th century. Um, but it's this fascinating thing that there's this long history of, of Judikitami inside one country, but nowhere else. And uh, I've always found that a fascinating, fascinating thing about the history of, of, of the move. So very, 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 very interesting stuff. Now, Travis is someone who comes from judo. Travis, by the way, is maybe the, or if not, certainly one of the best, most well-rounded grapplers in the world. Travis is an Olympic silver medalist in 2016 in judo. Travis is an elite jiu-jitsu competitor. And Travis, you're one of the best practitioners of jujikatami that I've ever seen, which is the straight armbar. Can you talk about how that's affected you? I mean, how you've used it in both judo and jujitsu? Yeah, for me, it's just one of those staples. It's part of every higher level judo players game, whether they use it in competitions or not, they're definitely aware of it. They definitely grew up with it. And it's taught to just about every judo player around the world. There's no missing that technique. Like it's some hidden secret. Like in jujitsu, we can go into certain schools where people don't teach foot locks or wrist locks, but you can't go into a judo dojo anywhere in the world and not know what a juji is. It's just such a staple part of our culture and our sport. And is that a move that you've been able to transition into jujitsu as you competed? Yeah, it has a a couple of different, you know, variations and tactics to it because the movements between a jiu-jitsu player and a judo player are very different. So the amount of effort it takes to do it in judo is a lot higher because we have to explode and get there. If I don't have that arm straight in a matter of a couple of seconds, then I've lost it, even if I'm 95% of the way there, which has happened a lot of times to me in matches. When I'm doing jiu-jitsu, I can really take my time, focus more on the technique and the leverage points of it. Where in judo, you know, it's more of that guerrilla strength and power. So one thing I've noticed the difference between judo and jiu-jitsu would be, it seems in jiu-jitsu when, when people put on the jujikatami, it's either from the bottom from the guard or on the top from the mount or from the side control. In judo, they, the setup's a little different. It yeah. seems to be more from the back. Is that is Yeah, that we set found? it up from turtle most of the time. Um, and that's usually due to false attacks or bad attacks from opponents, just working more on that transition style of the sport, which is most of judo anyways. I'd say that's probably 85 to 95% of the newaza portion to judo. And that's why us as Americans were so effective is because we focus more on the actual transitional part of the sport rather than the actual setups of we're on the ground, we start on the ground. Yeah, we we start taking our leverage points as we're going to the floor. So we're playing both defense in the standing position, but also offense when we hit the ground. So we're starting ahead of the game once we're down there. Sure, and that's why you feel like you're able to get into it so quickly from the back. In other words, a guy goes for a throw in judo, he misses, he goes down, and that's that's yeah. when you're starting your attack. Yeah, we'd already started. So you're not going to let him get down, settle in. You're going to be starting your attack as he's going down and turtling up. That's when you're starting your attack. If if he's gotten down there and he's settled in, the only way to get him open is just violence. Okay. There's no technique to it. There's no niceties about it because he's already playing defense. I got three seconds. There's no such thing as a technique to get through somebody's defense in three seconds. Not when their sole purpose is to let you do nothing. Cool. Okay. And John, how have you seen it applied in, say, sports other than jiu-jitsu and, and judo, say, sambo, for instance? Uh, there's no question going back to the, the judo element. You, you're absolutely correct. The, the, the two biggest differences you see between applications of judikatami and jiu-jitsu versus judo is time. Uh, typically, a judo player has much less time to work with. And most of the setups to judikatami in jiu-jitsu involve chest-to-chest -chest situations, the two athletes facing each other. So it tends to be used from guard, mounts, top side control. In judo, it's almost always used in chest-to-back situations where there's a failed throw. Now there's an opportunity to jump on top of a guy, chest-to-back, turtle position, throw in a hook, and there's your judikatami. Usually finish with some kind of rolling sequence in, ending in the, uh, in the familiar finishing position. Um, uh, similarly, in, in, in samba, you most of the finishes seem to come out of failed throws where someone ends up chest to back and you see 
very, very high levels of uh, skill involved in rolling people over from a kneeling position in turtle to one where they're flattened out on their back. And uh, uh, interestingly, you will also see a lot in Sambo of standing Jujigatami attacks where people will jump into the move. And um, they've been using these kind of tactics for a, a long time. You'll see a lot of flying arm locks in, in uh, Sambo. Also, I noticed that the rate of flying arm locks is going up in Judo these days. They actually just banned that. Really? It's a direct Tansukumake or a direct Shido as of mid this year. Interesting. Because yeah. the, the, the numbers were increasing. Yeah, especially from like 2015 to yeah. towards 17, you really started to see them come back. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, the IJF just pulled it. Wow. They don't want anyone having fun, huh? Yeah, no. Um, that's brutal because because the success rate was getting very very impressive, yeah. um, and you know, a uh, uh, Gatami attacked from the standing position. It's a it's a surprising move, which you, it it often offers uh, a lesser thrower an opportunity to beat a better thrower. Yeah, you know, you you you're, you're expecting one thing. Suddenly, a guy's got his full body weight on your arm in the standing position. You're crashing to the mat. Um, one of the most famous. Uh, episodes in in uh, judo history occurred with this when Izawa Kano, one of the greatest judo players of all time, took on a relatively unknown Russian opponent in the mid 1960s. Now at this time, Okano was literally a god of judo. He was one of the you know, pound for pound, probably the best in the world at that time. 65 kilos. And uh, yeah, and that's insane to think a guy 65 kilos is going out and winning all Japan. It's wow. just insane. But he got caught early on in one match by not a flying Jujigatami, but a sitting Jujigatami, where he, his opponent just sat back to the ground from standing position and just caught him. And uh, one of the greatest of all time just got caught in a matter of seconds and had to tap. Um, so in that Russian tradition, that Samo tradition of attacking Jujigatami from unexpected standing positions, that, that's an important part of the sport. I'm sad to hear it's been taken out of Judo. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's there sad. are a couple of players really making a name for themselves, yeah. pulling yeah. that move off. Yeah. Now, I mean, something that, John, you see a lot, how do you see Jujigatami being used in MMA? Uh, that's a fascinating question. One of the most obvious features of, of uh, Jujigatami is its versatility. It's one of those magical moves which is equally good with and with and without a gi. It's equally good standing and on the ground. It's equally good chest to chest and chest to back. It's equally good with a gi or without a gi. And it's equally good in both grappling and fighting. It has a very high percentage success rate in the sport of mixed martial arts. It's among the more highly regarded submission holds. Um, and there have been athletes who specialize in it. You remember Ronda Rousey, really made a career on Jujigatami. Sure, yeah. became one of the biggest celebrities in the sport, largely as a result of her throwing ability and her, and her Jujigatami. Everyone knew it was coming. No one could stop it. Um, it's because of her visibility in the sport. I think a lot of people now recognize Jujigatami when it's being set up. You hear the crowd screaming when you see the setups being employed. Um, of all the main submission holds, I think it's become one of the most recognizable now, largely because of Ronda Rousey's success with it in competition. It's noticeable when you're out coaching at a major mixed martial arts event now, when you see someone getting closer to it, the crowd starts reacting. They know what's coming up. They yeah. understand it now. It's not like the early UFCs where people just had no idea what was happening. So um, uh, it's success in mixed martial arts. is It's proven. There's been great champions who used it repeatedly. Um, it's been responsible for some great victories, outstanding matches that people still remember. And uh, it's rare to see a couple of UFCs go by without an armbar in there somewhere. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's absolutely vindicated both in grappling and in fighting. I remember an early one where um, Frank Mir was in the guard. He was on Sylvia. That's right, yeah, yeah. And it was, the break almost happened right down yeah, here. It was the below the elbow. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very unusual. I think it goes to the principle you were teaching today where the lever and fulcrum, it kind of matters most where you put the fulcrum, correct? Yeah, I think in that case, the fulcrum may have been literally on the bone rather than the elbow. Yeah. Um, sometimes in those cases, things like uh, many of the athletes wear steel cups. I was going to ask that. Yeah. So I, I wonder if maybe that played a role in that in that break. No, speaking of someone who you just brought up, Rhonda, Travis, I know you had some experience with her in the past, I mean, at least training with her and coaching. Was her Juji Gatami as dominant when she competed in judo? Yeah, I mean, she won a lot of international tournaments and beat a lot of high-level competitors with it. I mean, it was she was known for it even in judo. Isn't it true that her mother was excellent with it? 
that goes way beyond my time. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. And um, so we've been here shooting a video on Juju Kitami. And uh, while I have these two guys here, I mean, I think it's interesting how they kind of came to know each other. Um, Travis was uh, somehow came to be studying under John, and I believe it was only about a year and a half before you gave him his black box. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, no, he was he – was Definitely not your average uh, student when he came in the door. No. Um, no. Uh, when you coach the sport for a while, you, you can take one look at someone yep. and as they engage and you can immediately assess what their general skill level is. Um, uh, obviously, Travis was a world-class judoka in the standing position. Now, in a jiu-jitsu school, the most you will see out of even elite uh, black belts is – competence in the standing position you'll see you know the, the best jiu-jitsu players are competent in the standing position but they're not good there's a there's a world of difference between someone who's competent in the standing position versus someone who's extraordinarily good um uh and uh, travis was obviously elite level by judo standards which is a whole different ballpark sure. from uh competence in the standing position by jiu-jitsu standards so um, that's, that's always eye-catching. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than well-performed judo. I've always said about judo, when it's done well, it's the most beautiful sport in the world. And when it's done badly, it's the ugliest sport in the world. <laughs> so um, uh, when you see elite-level judo, it's, it's, it's an impressive thing to watch. Um, uh, but what was shocking is he was also damn good on the ground. And that's, uh, you know, what you see typically with judo is you see tremendous variation among individuals and their competence on the ground. It's possible to become a great champion in judo, sorry, in judo with fairly limited ground skills. You can do it. Um, but it's also possible to become a great champion with average throwing skills provided you're good enough on the floor. But you've got to have a means of getting it to the ground in ways that are effective. Um, now, when I say average throwing skills, I mean average by international judo standards. Yeah. That would still put them light years ahead of anything you'll see in, <laughs> in jiu-jitsu in, in the standing position. Um, so uh, you get judo players who specialize in groundwork, and some of them are damn good. Travis is one of them. Another guy that I always thought was tremendously effective on the floor was uh, a Brazilian fellow, Flavio Canto, who had tremendous groundwork. Um, I'm not sure what his relationship with jiu-jitsu was. Uh, I've heard different reports. Um, it seems that he was mostly doing judo. He, he may have been a jiu-jitsu guy up until blue or purple, but I'm not entirely sure. So maybe someone out there watching this video knows more about that. But um, one thing everyone agrees on, he was damn good on the ground. Even sure. even by jiu-jitsu standards, he would be a real threat. He's had some wars with the guy to your right. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, several actually. Yeah. yeah. How many matches did you guys have? Three. Three in total. Okay. Amazing. And what was, what was the record in those? Two and one. You were two and one? Yeah. Yeah. I lost once in the finals of a World Cup in Portugal, I think it was. Yeah. I remember there was one where he you ended up breaking his arm with a throw, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, he's an absolute legend. And Yeah. And he actually one. beat me on the ground the one time he beat yeah, me. Yeah, I remember seeing that. It. Yeah. it was no psychomia pin, right? No, he neck cranked me. Okay. Yeah. What that happened? Hurt. He got me in mount and cranked my neck. Wow. Yeah. Uh, aren't neck cranks illegal in judo? Yeah, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, like... <laughs> it's illegal when the ref sees it, correct? Oh, it's illegal when the refs are educated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can't tell me when people have wrist locked in competitions just to get the arm free for Juji. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh... Now, Travis, so, I mean, you've taught with, uh... You've studied with judo coaches and jiu-jitsu coaches all over the world, but you kind of settled on John as your jiu-jitsu coach. What was it that led you to him? Um, there's a there's a lot of coaches out there that they they don't really understand what it is they're teaching like they have kind of like an idea but the one thing john was able to do was when i came to class whatever john was teaching after five or six times of drilling it or five or six minutes it worked during the later half of the class it yeah. wasn't this mythical move that i had to do for six months to eventually get on a white belt it was like no even at the highest level, even with the purple belts, the brown belts, and some of the black belts, you could find yourself in those positions and getting 80 to 90% of the way there, if not all the way, by the end of class. And it was just the way he conveyed it, taught it, watched the classes, put everything together that just, it made sense to me specifically. 
maybe not to other people, but to me, and that's why I was able to pick it up so quickly. It was yeah. just, okay. it just makes sense. I think for me, and one of the reasons why John has resonated so well with our viewers is that he has just this way of articulating what's going on and showing and demonstrating it in a way that you haven't thought of. I watched John teach uh, the, the Juju Katami today. I, I, while I enjoyed it, I found it incredibly frustrating because I, I was just going back on all the mistakes that I've made over the years. Like, ah, how did I not know this? Because there's so much conflicting information that you hear, even the more that you study. Keep your legs apart. Keep them together. And he explained the biomechanics of every bit of it and why they worked. And I felt like, yeah, I could go out there and be better with it right away. And um yeah, just amazing. I mean, John, what is it about your background that you think allows you to articulate things in a way that's so different from the I, way other teachers do? I think it? it's very important that whenever you demonstrate a given move, that you have to be able to give cogent and practical reasons why things are the way you teach them. Okay. If someone comes to me and asks me to demonstrate a move, the first thing I'm going to start doing is first, they got to see what the move is. And then once there's a broad outline of the move, you've got to start explaining to them why things are done as they are. If you can't give a rational set of reasons as to why things are done that way, something's wrong. It either means the, the move as you're teaching it maybe is based on some flawed assumptions, things that maybe you just picked up over the years that had never really been tested um, and may not even be important. Um, or it may mean that you simply lack knowledge of the technique maybe you just you you can do it but you can't explain it to someone else um but the moment you can give a rational reason why things are done as they are that's when people can start to pick things up quickly people will forget most information very very rapidly but they don't tend to forget when they're given a reason why they ought to do something they tend to remember the why much better than they remember just simple directions. Always what I'm trying to do is to get people to think in terms of what are they supposed to be doing in the broad sense. So they have a general sense of direction. So once you give someone a sense of direction, the details can always be added on afterwards. But if you just throw details at people, they just get forgotten as quickly as they get learned. Yeah, for sure. But when you first give them a sense of, okay, here's the big picture, what we're trying to accomplish. Here's some details to help you accomplish that. And here's why those details are the way they are. If you attack every problem on those three levels, big picture, details, and a set of reasons why the details are as they are, people tend to not only remember more of the information they're given, but they can act upon it more quickly because they know in general what they're supposed to be doing and they can move towards a goal. What you can't have is someone who just forgot everything from 10 minutes ago and now they've got a guy jumping on top of them. They don't even have a, the beginnings of an idea where to go. They're trying to remember detail here. Where should my left foot be? Where should my right foot be? And this guy's all over them. Of course, you just go back to what you've always been doing. But if you give someone a general picture, Okay, and you, um, let's say for case, in, in, in the case of Judigatami, and we talk about the position of, of my cross face leg. What should my cross face leg be doing? And, um, uh, and its position on the shoulder, uh, far shoulder, near shoulder, um, the, the very things that we demonstrate on, on today's uh, filming. People can remember things like this very easily. And they may not get the details 100% correct, but that's not the idea. The idea is not to be 100% correct the first time you try it. The idea is to get someone in the ballpark. And once they're in the ballpark, they can always get closer and closer to the goal over time. But what stops people's progress is when they just get shut out. They learn a new move. It looks exciting. They try it, and there's just total failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when they're just like, yeah, I won't even bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But if they, can, if they can get a sense where they can see possibility for the future, they'll persist. They'll learn more about it. And they'll add to their knowledge willingly. But when there's this complete failure from the outset, that's when everything goes wrong. So my whole interest as a coach is to get people beginning to succeed so they can feel potential in a move. If someone can feel potential, they will persist with it over time. They'll 
They'll even come up with things on their own. They'll innovate. They'll, they'll research on their own time. They'll ask me more questions. And in time, over a, ser a series of weeks or months, in Travis's case, days, um, they'll get damn good at that move. Yeah, I think that's a lot more effective than when you tell someone why rather than when someone asks the coach, well, why do you put your foot on the shoulder? And they say, yeah, yeah that's not, yeah. It's not Now, it can't all be well. theoretical knowledge. You can't just all just be throwing concepts yeah. at people. At some point, you've got to give them practical information. You've got to go, there's a guy on top of you trying to punch you in the face. How do you stop him? Um, uh, so there has to be this interface between practical details on the one hand and a sense of direction on the other. What's the big picture here? What are we trying to accomplish? And um, when you get those two smoothed out and working together, that's when magic starts to happen. That's when you get people learning at a, a very fast rate. I think the last thing I'd want to talk about is that- One second. Yeah, sure. Since you, since you went down that road, yeah. and I know a lot of people struggle with this, and a lot of coaches struggle with this for their athletes, but it's something I always try to convey to my students. And I use throughout my career, and I've heard you say is, where do you draw the line between adding the what if scenarios on top of each other versus bringing it back down to our base level of just, we got to get back to the basics and strengthen the foundation versus continually adding on new moves and new processes and different techniques mm. to really build a player up. Um, there's always, there's two ways you can go with accumulating knowledge in any combat sport. You can go with breadth of knowledge where you try to learn a little bit about a lot. And you can go with depth of knowledge where you try to learn a lot about a few things. The general pattern in combat sports is this. In order to defend yourself from the huge number of possible attacks that your opponent can bring upon you, it's important that you have breadth of knowledge. You have to know a, a little bit about a lot. Because if I know even a little bit, I can anticipate an attack coming. And anticipation is always the first line of defense. If I can see what the beginnings of an armbar looks like, even if I have a lousy armbar, I can see the setup, I can avoid it. So as far as defense goes, knowing a little bit about a lot is a huge benefit. But when it comes to offense, the exact opposite is true. Then you've got to select a small number of moves and have a huge amount of knowledge about those small number of moves. That's why my coaching style is always built around offensive systems. Essentially, I really teach six different submission holds and I build extravagant systems around those six. When one of my students gets into a battle over one of those submission holds, whether it be Kimura, a heel hook, or what have you. They know so much more in that isolated domain than their opponents, that even when they've only been training four or five years and their opponent has 20 years, the amount of knowledge they've accrued and the amount of experience they've accrued in that one specific position is vastly greater than that 20 year veteran has. And so what we do is we create these knowledge wars in isolated areas where we have vastly more knowledge and, and, and skill in those isolated areas, even if we're less skilled overall than the opponent. Yeah, we do the same thing in judo where our gripping system tends to bring people into a world that they don't understand the fight that mm. they're in and they don't know where to fight, where to defend, where to be offensive, when to attack, and it tends to break down our opponents when we're doing judo. Excellent. So how do you have your players bring people into that world? You've got to have a set of basic entries from any given position. Now, the good news is if you operate with a sense of direction, it's pretty easy under most circumstances to pull an opponent into a given uh, realm. You, you'll recognize this, of course, from gripping. If you just want an overback grip, and say your throw required an overback grip. It's not that difficult to engineer a gripping sequence which accesses your opponent's back. If I want to get into my opponent's legs, it's not that difficult for me to go through gripping sequences which give me inside position and elevation and I'm in my opponent's mm -hmm. legs. If I want a front headlock, it's not a difficult thing for me to fake legs, bring the head down, snap downs, et cetera, et cetera, and I've got a front headlock. Um, that sense of direction along with uh, uh, some fairly simple 
easily learned techniques to get into the scenarios we favor is not a difficult thing. And you see that obviously in judo with, with grip fighting too. Um, uh, for example, I, I think it's fair to say that it's a hell of a lot easier to teach someone grip fighting sequences in the standing position in judo than it is to teach throws. Yes. Um, someone who's an incompetent thrower can be a damn good gripper. Correct. And can make themselves a real menace in the standing position just on grips. Yeah. Um, so too in, in jiu-jitsu down on the ground, someone who had uh, a guard which in some ways might seem quite deficient can nonetheless be very, very good at engaging in grips and elevating an opponent and getting into their legs. So you create this bias where when my students go out and see an opponent in front of them, they're so programmed as to what they want to do to get into legs, kimura, front headlock, etc., that they can engage in a gripping uh, uh, scenario where most of the action is going to be taken in towards uh, those six systems that we favor. Now, what happens when one of your players is needs to also play defense to the other person's realm or series of attacks that may avoid the scenario you're trying to be in? That's a great question. And that leads us on to our next video series. Oh. Um, uh, <laughs> we're about to complete the, uh, the uh, Enter the System series with the armbar. And after that, we're going to go on to fundamentals. One thing I always say to my students is this. Um, which one of the systems which I teach as far as attacks goes, you favor the most? I leave that up to the students. Some will like these, some will like this. It, that's individual preference. But one thing I'll never let you go with is the fundamentals. Okay, If you don't have strong escapes, if you don't have a guard that is difficult to pass, if you don't have strong guard passing skills and all the essential skills of the sport, I don't care how good you are at the systems, at some point someone's going to find a way to resist them and your game's going to get shut down. He's going to take you into territory that now you're unfamiliar with and you're going to get beaten. Um, I always put a very, very high priority, especially in the early years, on people having a strong sense of the fundamentals of the sport. Systems-based approach to jiu-jitsu is wonderful. I've made, a, made it my life's work. But all of that is worthless without a strong underpinning in the essential skills of the sport. Things like guard retention, guard passing. It's difficult to even conceive of someone who would be successful in the sport who didn't have a strong guard retention, who didn't have an ability to get past their opponent's legs, or at least put so much pressure on their opponent with those movements that they had to react in some way which set up your offense back into the systems that I teach. Um, so always there's this juxtaposition between the need for strong fundamentals across the board, which I won't let a student get by without, and then on the one hand, once they've mastered that, build it on top of that with the idea of preference and choice, where they get a choice between offensive systems, of which I focus mostly on six. <laughs> well, John's organization to his approach is, is really kind of unprecedented. I mean, the whole part about thinking of systems, I know Travis has adapted a lot of it. Travis has a gripping system, Travis has throwing systems, and look at the success. And I think that um, what Jimmy, uh, who's Travis's judo coach, uh, talked to me about one time was that systems give you the ability to be more predictable, meaning you stop once you have good systems, you stop losing the people that you shouldn't be losing to. Yeah. Do you guys find that true with the consistency? Absolutely. And also, interestingly, they make your opponents more predictable. Yeah. Because once you put them into a system, every time you go to enact step A of the system, that restricts their possible reactions to it. Now you know pretty much ahead of time what they're going to be doing. Yeah. By the time you get down steps B, C, D, and E, they've only got one or two options left. And so your opponents become predictable. You become more predictable to watch as an athlete. Everyone knows what you're doing. Um, uh, the outcomes of your matches become more predictable. You win more. And interestingly, the actions of even the most chaotic opponents start to become more predictable. You start to realize, hey, if I put this guy in step A, he's only got five options. If I go further into step B, he's down to three options. C, now he's down to two options. And then that's when you start winning on a consistent level. Well, I'd like to thank you both for being here. I, one thing I want to say before these guys leave is that it's my role. I have a very, I have a very good job. I have a very fun job, and I get to meet the best jujitsu people in the world, the best grapplers. And if I were to name 
and I'm saying this publicly, the two people that I would say are the smartest people that I know about grappling, the first two would come to mind are the two guys to my right right here. And I think that what that illustrates is that knowledge is cumulative. I mean, we're talking about both people here have a really strong cross multidisciplinary approach. And I think it kind of really speaks to the point that the more you learn, the more the whole picture starts to make sense. Would you both say oh, that's true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it would be a sad world if you thought that any one grappling style was the whole picture of, of the sport. You, you've got to go outside of your – of course, it's yeah. good to have one style you focus on, but um, it's good to have an area of specialty. But um, you're always limiting yourself if you just say that's the whole story of the game. Go out and study wrestling. Go out and study judo. Go out and study sambo. They've all got fascinating additions. I never saw anyone in jiu-jitsu who got worse by studying judo or wrestling sure. or sambo. I only saw people who got better. For sure. Well, everyone, thanks very much. I'd like to thank these guys uh, for helping us, but also my own personal journey. They both made my life a lot more fun by teaching me a lot of grappling. And so thanks so much and look forward to the next episode. And Bernardo will be back and I'll be talking a lot less.